here's here's yet another test, folks, that you can try. This one's easy. So just clasp your fingers together as if you're praying. Look at which thumb and finger is on top. Now, without looking at your hands, I want you to unclasp your, your hands and now put them back together again with the opposite thumb and fingers on top. Now, keep your hands in this position. This feels unnatural. Your natural way of clasping your hands is to have the left thumb on top. The unnatural way is to have your right thumb on top. And so keeping your hands like this, you're getting a message from your brain that's an alert that's saying, hey, something's different about what you're doing here. There's another part of your brain that's saying, this isn't right. We need to do it the way that we've been trained. But what if clasping your fingers with your right thumb on top instead of your left solved your pain? Your brain only knows that you're doing something different. It doesn't yet know that that different thing is good for you. Just like it doesn't understand that the natural way that you're clasping your fingers is the thing that's causing your pain. Because the brain is saying, hey, that's the way I've been taught. This is what we're doing. It hasn't yet learned that that is the source of the pain. I'm Amy Connell. Welcome to Graced Health, the podcast for women who want simple and grace-filled ways to take care of themselves and enjoy a little chocolate. I am a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach who wants you to know your eating, movement, and body don't have to be perfect. You just need to be able to do what you're called to do. According to the CDC, in 2016, an estimated 20.4% of U.S. adults had chronic pain. By the way, I don't know that I've ever told you how much I enjoy statistics and data. I definitely included a lot in my book, but I just, I have always just loved, I, I find statistics fascinating. So anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. And in fact, I started poking around for that number and it is all over the place. But I do think the CDC is a good place to go for um, just general US data. Anyway, back to chronic pain. If you aren't dealing with chronic pain, chances are you know someone who is. Uh, the areas that are afflicted often include like your back, people, I mean, how many people are complaining of back pain all the time? Our neck, our feet, our hips. And I have witnessed how just debilitating and um, life changing in not a great way for those who are afflicted with chronic pain. Today's guest is Rick Olderman, who is a physical therapist, and he offers a different way of treating chronic pain without medication. And this is what I love. When it comes down to it, it's very simple. He integrates slight adjustments to some of your daily living activities like walking or sitting or standing. And you're going to hear some of those today because he's very generous with his tips. And uh, he just wants you to start feeling better. I have actually incorporated a lot of these tips since interviewing him and admit that they help me, especially during my interviews. I will often uh, stand when I do uh, interviews because it's just, I don't know, it just feels better to stand unless I'm standing the wrong way and then my lower back hurts. So we talk some about that. Let me tell you a little bit about Rick. He is a sports and orthopedic physical therapist with more than 25 years experience. Um, and he specializes in helping people with chronic pain experience a pain free life. Rick has written the popular Fixing You series of books found on Amazon to help people with chronic pain or injuries. More recently, Rick has created downloadable video home programs to help people solve pain from head to toe, and he has these somewhat specialized as well. These programs include his pioneering approach that has helped solve hundreds of cases of chronic pain in his clinic for the last 10 years. He has a new book, Solving the Pain Puzzle, coming out in 2023, and has posted a few chapters from that book on his website, rickolderman.com. And yes, this will be in the show notes, where people can also pre-order the book and find the home programs as well as other free stuff. And more than anything, and you will hear this in my conversation with Rick, he just wants to enhance the quality of life by helping people fix their pain once and for all. 
Now, I do want to just point out that you are going to hear a few things counter to how I coach and how you may have been coached, specifically related to planks and shoulder blades. So keep in mind throughout this whole conversation, Dr. Rick is approaching this from a chronic pain perspective. If you have chronic pain, particularly in your back or your neck, you may want to try the adjustments he suggests. If not, do what feels right to you and keep this information in your back pocket if you do develop chronic pain or share with someone who has it. And on the topic of sharing things that we know and would love with our friends, I can't tell you how many conversations I have had with friends over the last six months that revolve around peeing while sneezing, coughing, or doing any high impact movements. One friend said when she walks too much, her insides feel like they are dropping out and another has to be close to the bathroom at all times for all reasons, if you know what I'm talking about. Every time I tell them the same thing, you have got to try the Tighten Your Tinkler program. If you've been listening for a while, you may remember my truly delightful conversation with the Tighten Your Tinkler girls, Jen Lormand and Christina Walsh, which was full of laughter about a heavy subject, pelvic floor health. I've personally gone through the program and am pleased to report I don't have to stop, stop and cross my legs when I sneeze anymore. And I will tell you coming off a cold, this is a big win for me because I was sneezing and coughing a lot. And even my nighttime bathroom trips have reduced. So I com- I consider this an all-nighter. Like this at 48, this is an all-nighter and it's great news. My nagging lower back issue is significantly better as well thanks to the program and tools they provided. If you deal with any of these issues or more serious ones like prolapse or discomfort during or after intimacy, or just need to get everything back in place after a hysterectomy, this program is for you. We want you to take back control of your body and regain your confidence. Jen and Christina are the women you want in your corner, and they have generously offered $50 off using the code Graced Health, G R A C E D. H-E-A-L-T-H, all one word. Click the link in the show notes to learn more. And if you haven't listened to our episodes and really just want to laugh along with us, go back and check them out. As a bonus, this program is FSA and HSA eligible. So click the link, enroll, and use Graced Health for $50 off. Okay, let's get into our show today. Rick, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me, Amy. Are you sure we have time after that long intro? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's tricky. I get it, right? It's tricky because you've got a lot of stuff out there and you want to let people know about it because this is something that you've put your heart and soul into. And yes. sometimes that just adds up, especially when you've been, you know, in the industry for 25 years. Yeah, so yeah. it's all it's all good. It's all welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so speaking of that, you do have 25 years with helping people with chronic pain, experience that pain-free life and without medication too, by the way. So I would love to know, like, what's the backstory behind that? Because often our passion comes from maybe our own pain or our own experiences or something like that. Yeah. So you're, you're right on track with that one. So I had back pain prior to going to PT school and I thought, wow, when I go to PT school, I'm going to learn these insider secrets because some intuitively I felt that something I was doing or something I did caused my back pain. And so I thought, okay, well, PT school is going to teach me what that, what those things were really. It didn't, unfortunately. And what they, what PT schools typically focus on are the structures that are injured, not so much why they become injured. And so we, we, we do great with anatomy physiology and, you know, digging down into uh, these specific tests to identify specific tissues, but there are zero tests that determine why things are injured. And so uh, my first job after PT school, this really bore out because I did great with people with sprains, strains, surgical issues, and all sorts of things. But when it came to chronic pain, it was hit or miss whether I could help someone or not, whether I luckily struck on the right thing to do. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I felt that I should do better than this. Right? And so I set on this path of really understanding, hey, what is causing all of this chronic pain that I haven't been taught in PT school? And that's 
what I've been kind of researching and experimenting with clinically and for the last 10 years or so, uh, or actually longer. But, uh, and that's how I've come to what I know today. Well, it sounds like you definitely did learn and learn the the why rather than just the structure behind it. (laughs) Totally. That's where the power is. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I totally, um, I get that for sure. So I have conversations with a lot of people and I'm not a physical therapist. I do geek out about learning stuff and I will often hear people say like, well, you're, you know, because of what you know, which is not nearly as much as what you know, Rick or, you know, other people, but they'll start asking me things. And I, I, I hear three common things over and over and over again, especially with women um, in this, you know, in this kind of age group of my community, but also, I mean, I hear it in men, um, but that is knees, back and feet. And it kind of, and, it, and it, it will depend, but I hear that over and over and over again, knees, back and feet. Um, and the feet, you know, there's a lot of plantar fasciitis, which I know that there's a lot of why behind that. But why do you think that these areas consistently give us so much pain? Well, why don't we just throw hips in there too? Because uh, the hip joint's pretty important, that whole sequence and chain of events. Uh, really, it's all the same thing, Amy, to put it simply. Once you understand how the body works as a system, you understand how the hip affects the knee and the foot, how the foot affects the knee and the hip and the back. So it all integrates. And the, so that's the unique thing about my home programs is that when you get the back pain program, you'll find that there's relatively few things that are targeting the back. It's all about the lower extremity system because that is what's putting stress on the back. So the same thing that might solve someone's back pain, in fact, I have a patient story about that, will also solve plantar plantar fasciitis often in many cases. So I had a woman with 15 years of chronic back pain. No one could solve it. She was a division one swimmer, lost her scholarship because she had too much back pain, couldn't swim anymore. And No, for 15 years, no one could figure it out. She came into my clinic, not for back pain, but for her plantar fasciitis because she had completely given up on her back pain. And she was in so much pain with her back, I couldn't even do an exam with her. But just watching her walk to my table, I knew exactly what the problem was. And so we did one simple solution. I tape, I put a couple little pieces of tape on the back of her knee. Three days later, both the back pain and plantar fasciitis, 75% better. And wow. this kind of, these kinds of, so, of solutions come from understanding things from a systems standpoint. Well, and what you're discussing there is like the kinetic chain, right? I mean, like just yeah. everything, everything goes from one side to the other and up and down. And, you know, it's, I, sometimes when I'm feeling really brave, I'll sing that little song on here. I'm not going to do it today because I'm a terrible singer, but like, you know, what is it? The hip bones connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone connected to the knee bone, which yeah. anyway, it's like that. That's true. Like this really is. And you can't just isolate these particular areas. I mean, and obvious, oftentimes it's something in a completely different area that's impacting the pain. Exactly. And so this is what I describe as component thinking. So when we are trained in medicine, we're trained in component thinking, drilling down and using our scans and a myriad of tests to determine the specific tissue that's injured. But And that's really nice for identifying acute I- issues. But when it becomes a chronic issue, component thinking isn't really where it's at. You've got to be able to back out and look at the whole system. Mm-hmm. And even though that song is probably decades old, this is what isn't being taught in at least physical therapy schools. Because in my clinic, I wouldn't let another therapist work at my clinic unless I trained them in this systems thinking approach. Not one of those physical therapy schools uh, taught systems thinking. It was all component thinking, which you need to pass the national board exam. I get that, but it's not helping our chronic pain patients. So let's let's zoom out a little bit. You've, you've talked some about your program. You've talked about you know the systems standpoint. So what does that mean? What does that look like? I know you have these programs. But I'm curious if you might be able to give some people maybe a little bit of um, recommendations or general guidance, right? Because we all have our own individual things. Like, what are you, I guess another question is, what are you, if you could have someone say, or if you could have someone do a particular few things that might help the holistic aspect of their pain, uh, what might that be, again, from a systematic perspective? Yeah. So most of the people listening to this have back pain, mm-hmm. right? So let's just, let's just talk about back pain because that's 
everyone has right. some experience with that. So um, what I'd like to do is take your listeners through a little test and show you exactly what I mean by this. Okay. So the test is very simple. All you have to do is lie down on the floor or on your bed or on a couch. And I want your legs to be straight. And really, folks, if you're listening and watching this, do this test because it's, it's nice to listen to the words. But until you feel the truth in your body, you won't really absorb the information. So really, do, you're going to learn a lot just from this little simple little test. So lie down on your back with your legs straight. And I want you to feel what your back feels like in this situation. And uh, now what I want you to do is bend your knees so your feet are flat on the floor. And if your back pain doesn't change with that position, go ahead and hug your knees to your chest. All you're figuring out is which position feels better for your back, knees bent or legs straight. 99% of the people out there will say, my back feels much better when my knees are bent. So what this is telling you is that, and you'll notice that when your legs are straight, your back arches off the floor a little bit more. And when your knees are bent, your back flattens to the floor a little bit more. But this doesn't mean that your back has the wrong shape. Really what's happening is that your, when your legs are straight, the connections from your legs to your pelvis are causing your back to become more arched, which is increasing your pain. And when we bend your knees, we remove the majority of those forces acting on your pelvis, which then allows your back to assume its more normal position. So here's how this plays out in terms of what we do in life. So now everyone stand up and listen to the rest of this podcast. And what you'll notice in about a minute or two, what you'll notice if you pay attention is that your knees are locked straight back and you're not even aware of this until I've maybe made you aware of that. So I want you to feel, let's go ahead and lock your knees back if they aren't already. And I want you to feel what your back feels like in this position. By the and way, gonna, I'm standing. So I'm kind of doing this as you're talking. <laughs> perfect. All right. Uh, me too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, so now what I want you to do is slightly unlock your knees. You don't have to squat or anything, but just don't lock the knees. Just soften them. What, yeah, just soften them and feel what just happened to your back. All right. And if you're not sure, lock the knees again now and feel what just happened to your back. So you'll notice that when your knees are locked, you're arching your back more. Mm -hmm. When your knees are softer, you arch your back less. We just found out on the floor that your back feels better when your knees are bent. And you just found out that your normal standing habit is that you lock your knees. So if we just change this one behavior that you have and getting you to start unlocking your knees, I'm telling you, I saw like 50% of back pain just by getting people to unlock their knees when they're standing or walking. So this is what I mean by a systems approach is that the pain that they're experiencing isn't that their leg, that they're not spending enough time with their knees bent on the floor. The, the, the pain is coming because of how they're standing and how they're walking, which is hammering the low back constantly throughout the day. Change those habits and you change your pain. Okay. That makes a lot of sense, especially because I will often do these interviews standing up. It just, I just get squirmy when I'm sitting down and I'm all over the place. So I'll stand up. And I have noticed that often after these interviews, I'm like, God, lay my back hurts. And it's probably because I am not only I'm standing with my knees locked, but I will, one of the things that I will do is I'll just stand on one leg. So standing mm -hmm. on one leg, great for the balance, but if you're going to lock your knees out while you're doing it, probably not super helpful either. Absolutely. And, and so this is a great point, Amy. So a lot of people stand for their jobs or they have bought a standing desk to work at their, at their job to th because they think that that's going to solve their back pain, but it doesn't if you're locking your knees. The other thing that's going to throw your back into this super arch position is if you stand with your feet in parallel like this. And instead, if you're going to be at a standing desk, you should stand with one foot forward and the other one back and then weight bear more on the forward foot with the knee soft rather than the back. So distribute your weight, maybe 60 or 70 percent forward and 30 or 40 percent back. And that will take your body out of that pattern of causing the back to arch. You can experiment with this right now on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Well, and this also takes me back to when I was learning to type and my community is going to get this like type on the typewriter and they were really focused on your posture. And also I remember, you know, sit down and have one foot forward, slightly forward. So I know that was sitting, but I have to imagine that there's a little bit of maybe without even then even knowing it, but there's a little bit of that component in as well, just like without just taking that into that same plane and maybe moving it a little bit. I don't know. I'm speculating. Yeah. So, well, what's happening with that cue 
when you have one leg forward when you're sitting and you're typing on a typewriter back in the old days and uh, you, when you, you had to lean forward to type on that typewriter, right? Uh-huh. And when you're leaning forward, if your feet are in parallel, now your back is holding you up. But when you have one foot forward and one foot back, now you can put some weight on that forward leg and it can help your back hold yourself up. Going deeper into a solution for this, if you're sitting at your job, ergonomics are a big problem here, contributing to this pattern of of problems with backs. And so one of the things I simply get people to do is, you know, most chairs are too big for, for women. And so they end up sitting forward in their chair because it's so deep, they can't use the back. So what I simply have people do is, hey, bring a couple of uh, bed pillows in, shove them behind your back lengthways, mm-hmm. and bring the back to you so you don't have to scoot to the back. And when your back feels those pillows behind you, suddenly it's triggered to say, oh, I can relax into something now. You won't believe how much better your back will feel by having a little bit of support, and it can be as cheap as a couple bed pillows. The other thing is, is especially with shorter women, chairs don't get low enough or the desk is too high. And so they have to keep their chair up higher so that they can reach their keyboard and see their monitor. So again, if they're sitting forward in their chair, now their knees have dropped down below hip height and that pulls the pelvis forward and causes the back to arch again. So another easy tip is just to put a box or some books underneath your feet, bring the knees up, maybe even past hip height. And especially when you have those uh, pillows behind you, if you didn't have the pillows behind you and you did that, you would suddenly be thrown back in the back. And you wouldn't have any support to help you. But with those pillows there now, you've got something that's going to push your back into those pillows even more. Your back's going to feel even better. I had a woman cry, literally cry, when I showed her these ergonomic changes because she's never been able to sit without pain before. And this was the first time she sat without pain. She couldn't believe it. Wow. You that's have incredible. To a, it's yeah, so simple. It, it is so simple, Amy. So simple. I mean, I mean, you don't need to have high level knowledge to give the out bed pillow advice. <laughs> well, right? I will definitely tell them about it and tell them you taught me. <laughs> you talk about pillows. So I've got two questions. One is with the pillow, you know, I have seen those things that will kind of strap to the back of a seat or they're, they're a little bit curved. Is that something like what you're recommending? I mean, if, if you don't want to take bed pillows to work. You can certainly use those. So You'll notice, you know, I have a little issue with the curvature of those things. Okay. Because it's it's like saying, oh, your back needs to be arched more because that curve is there. Ah, uh, okay. But that's not really the problem. Uh, and because we're, we're all trained to think that we have to be this super erect posture when we're sitting. No, that's part of the problem. Because if you, you, you can feel it if you stand up right now, if you make your posture super erect, what happens? Your pelvis, pelvis tilts forward and your back arches more. And once again, we just found out that more back arching hurts your back. So if you're in that super erect posture, you're hurting your back. If that's all you have is one of those supports, it's better than nothing because at least your back can push against that. So that's, that's fine. But I just found the bed pillow gives more input to more of your back muscles to finally relax. Okay. All right. That makes a lot of sense. The other question I have as you're talking is, and I have a feeling I'm going to know your answer, but I'll let you answer it. I know a lot of people for a while, and maybe it's not so much anymore, is this, is sitting on a stability ball. What are your thoughts on that? Like bringing in that exercise ball, thinking that you're going to be working on your core and working on your balance, sitting on that. Okay. Well, core is a, is a, core work is a big medical myth. Mm-hmm. So I hardly ever work on core to solve back pain. It's like if you had a lever, a long lever arm, and you were trying to move this big boulder, working on the core is trying to push on that lever arm right next to the boulder. By the time that force is there, it's too late. You've got to fix the other forces further away that are acting on the back that have more leverage. The core has very little leverage on that. So to answer, and I can teach your listeners how to activate the core naturally to to help their backs if if you want to go down that road too. But basically the fit ball, if you found that your back hurts more with arching, then of course, if you sit on a fit ball with no support, your knees are going to be lower than your hips. You're going to throw your back into that arch and you're going to reinforce the pattern that's actually causing your back pain. Okay. So that's why I recommend something with a back Got to it. finally give those back muscles a break. They're working so hard to help you. They don't need to. 
Yes. And to answer your question, I would love to hear about natural core activation. Um, and I'm with you too. Like when I train, you know, a lot of women will come to me and they're like, well, I want to work on my core. And very rarely, very rarely are we doing crunches or anything like that. Cause I'm like, you know, it's when we're doing transverse movements. In fact, I had a client yesterday and she was doing kind of a high to low chop. And I was, I was like, this is core, by the way. I was like, this is, you know, it's not just crunch, 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 plank, plank, plank. And planks are wonderful unless you disagree. And I'd love to hear that, but it's just, it's so much more than that. So yeah. Tell us a little bit about these, um, these natural core activations for sure. Okay. So like everything in I teach, it's simpler than everyone is making it out to be. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so here, here it is with the core. I'll take everyone through another experiment. Okay. Perfect. So put one hand on your chest okay. and the other hand on your belly. And what I want you, everyone to do is just take a nice deep breath in and you'll feel that your chest lifts when you inhale, <sighs> exhale, and you'll feel the chest lowers. Take another deep breath in. And then this time when you exhale, you can exhale all the way, but don't let that rib cage or that chest come down all the way. It can come down 90% of the way. It can come down 95% of the way, but don't let it come down 100%. And if your hands are still on your chest and your tummy when you're doing this, you'll notice that when you prevent the chest from falling down all the way, your stomach has just activated. Now, we're not talking about 100% activation. It's like maybe 5 to 10% activated. So this is your core, all of those layers of abdominal muscles that we have, right? This is your core holding up your rib cage for you. That's what it's designed to do. Okay. You can do diagonal chops and thousands of sit-ups, but if you're not activating the core naturally when you're standing, all of that is preparing you maybe for sports, but not just normal day-to-day -day life. And right. so this is a much simpler... So. What's happening is that our core is neurologically turned off because one of the things that we're doing to achieve our posture instead of using our core is squeezing our shoulder blades down and back into their back pockets. So we think, oh, I'm just going to do this and now I'm upright. Well, the shoulder blade design is not designed, the architecture of that system is not designed to create good posture. That's an artificial way of achieving posture. Just simply lifting your rib cage maybe an eighth of an inch higher than what you normally and feeling that core activate naturally is really how this is supposed to work. The shoulder blades shouldn't have any role in this. And this is why we develop chronic neck pain and headaches too. Yeah. Let's dig into that a little bit more. I'd love to hear that because that was one of the things I wanted to learn more about. Yeah. Okay. So do you feel clear on the core? Thing? Yes. So yes. there's nothing wrong with doing transverse chops, but really it's not going to translate to life. When you're sitting at the computer, when you're walking down the street, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so here we go. So, and, uh, and by the way, I just want to interject really quickly. So, Rick is pulling out a skeleton. So, if you were going, if you're listening in your ears, keep listening. But if you need a visual for this, go over to YouTube and watch this. Okay, there now you go. And and also, if you want to Google skeleton, you'll you can see what I'm looking at. Okay. okay. All right. So my skeleton's just like the one on Google. All right. <laughs> So our, 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 you'll notice if you look at a skeleton, uh, we have lots of these long bones, the arm bones, the leg bones, the rib cage, all sorts of things. There's only two areas where we don't have long bones. One of those is the pelvis. And you can see that's a broad, flat bone. We all know that the pelvis is the center of function for our lower body and back system. Similarly, the other area of the body that has broad, flat bones is the shoulder blade or the scapula. This is also the center of function for our upper extremity system. There are rules about how the scapula or the shoulder blade should be resting and moving. I'm not going to go into detail on any of that. But the reason this is important for neck pain and headaches is because there are significant muscular attachments from the shoulder blade into the neck bones and the base of the skull. And when the shoulder blade isn't working correctly, force is transmitted via these muscles into the neck and the base of the skull, causing chronic neck pain and headaches. And I would almost venture to say that 100% of the people listening to this who have chronic neck pain and headaches, their practitioners or doctors have not looked at the shoulder girdle system as the cause. They've been looking at the neck and the head as the cause. Well, just like that boulder, right, that we're trying to move with that big lever arm, if you're right at the, at the junction of that lever arm and the boulder, it's too late. We need to work at the lever arms that are working and acting on the neck and head rather than just 
right here at the neck and head. That makes some, a lot of sense. Now, when you talk about that, like, what does that entail? I mean, I know, I know you've got these programs, but does that mean strengthening it? Does it mean like seeing a chiropractor and getting it adjusted? I mean, w- what type of work is done on the shoulder blade to address neck and headache issues? Yeah. So the saying goes, if you find yourself in a hole, first thing you got to do is stop digging. Right. <laughs> right. So that's what, when I mentioned that a lot of people are using their shoulder blades to create posture, this is one of the biggest problems causing chronic neck pain and headaches. Because in order to contract the shoulder blades together to create good posture, they are not only coming together at uh, dysfunctionally, but they are being depressed dysfunctionally. Because the okay. cue, if you go to any yoga class or Pilates class or dance or gymnastics, they're all training everyone to bring your shoulder blades down and back into the opposite back pockets. Yeah. That is the exact opposite of function. Okay. While it creates a good looking neck because we've, and I don't believe that those cues are inherent in original yoga discipline. I believe that they've carried over from dance. Dance has infiltrated into yoga and Pilates. Well, Joseph Pilates helped a lot of dancers, right? Right. So, and in dance, the aesthetic is to have a beautiful long neck like a ballerina. Well, that's nice for dance, but it's not great for anything other than dance. And so by, by doing this cueing where you bring the shoulder blades down and back into the opposite back pocket, you are locking the shoulder blades down into a depressed position, which is the opposite of how they should be working. The function of the shoulder blade is to assist the arm in raising overhead. To do that, it elevates and it rotates forward to help push the arm up into the air. By depressing the shoulder blades, and you'll see this in in gymnasts like in the Olympics, at the end of their routines when they bring both arms up in the air, you don't see those shoulders go up at all. Their shoulders are being depressed down into their hips. And I can guarantee you that many of those gymnasts have chronic neck pain and headaches. What happens is by trying to raise the arm and depressing the shoulder blade, You are short-circuiting the system. The stress is then transmitted directly into the neck bones and the base of the skull causing these chronic conditions. Okay. I believe you. (laughs) But so how as as a physical, uh, as a personal trainer, like if we are just doing a plank, for example, because this is something that is, is coached you know, a lot, if we're not supposed to coach with our, with, you know, shoulder blades back and down, because what I have learned is when we do that, that also will help bring the head up rather than just dropping that head all the way down. You know, I see a lot of rounding. I see a lot of concaved shoulders with the planking, which maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like that's not the kind of position and not how we want to train our body. So talk me through a little bit. Now I'm just getting into a personal um, yeah. tra- tra- training coaching program, right. but like for people who have been coached this way and trained this way, like what should they be doing instead? Well, I never do planks Okay. ever Okay. because a, if you look at a plank, the back is going to go into the arch. Okay. All right. Right off the bat. And, uh, and so what's happening is you're reinforcing a strength pattern that is reinforcing the pain pattern. Okay. We need to break that. So that's, and I don't, I, I believe the cost to benefit ratio of a plank exercise, while it is great for strengthening a lot of things, I believe the cost to benefit ratio is too high. And so there are many other ways to strengthen the core. Uh, if that's what you're going for with planks, than doing a plank what in life do we ever do that we require a plank? Right. However, though, I feel like it, it can, ha- and I'm learning, right. I'm not, I'm really, I promise I'm not pushing back on this, but this is like going against a lot of what I have learned in other, and oh, other yeah. fitness professionals. Yeah. yeah. Well, because like there's, you know, it's going against physical therapy too. We're <laughs> trained on all this stuff too, Amy. You know, <laughs> this is why it took me so long to figure all this out. Cause I had to unlearn I, once I started figuring out why people were having pain, Mm -hmm. that's when I had to really reevaluate my whole education. I'm just like, holy smokes, a lot of this stuff is wrong. That's where the difficulty is, is changing the mentality of what we're doing because everyone else has done it. That's what's being taught. You know, that's, this is why chronic pain is happening. 
Right. Not to mention the mentality of like, I know that you are not a fan of no pain, no no gain, um, which I'm not either. But this mentality of in order to get a good workout, I have to, you know, breathe really hard and sweat really hard and just have a pool of, of sweat and be sore and all of that. Like there's this, this really, really like slam your face against the wall in every single workout mentality that I'm, I'm trying to get my community to be like, Hey, that's actually not super helpful for us. But that is also our American fitness culture, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, if you're training for a sport that requires anaerobic conditioning Mm -hmm. and sustained hyperloading of joints, then that's exactly the type of training you should be doing. But I can't think, I'm not doing that. I can't think of one sport that requires anaerobic, sustained anaerobic training and sustained uh, multi-joint full range of motion, uh, ballistic movements, you know, it, it's just not there. It's a, it's nice. You can do that occasionally, but to make that the whole workout and the purpose. And frankly, I mean, I love to get a good sweat going and I love to feel that muscle burn. So what, what I'm talking about is chronic pain mm-hmm. as opposed right. to personal training. Right. And so no pain, no gain, especially doesn't apply to chronic solving chronic pain. No pain, no gain may have some places in training, depending on your sports goals and what you're trying to achieve. Sure. Most of my community is not like training for (laughs) some big sports things. Yeah, Um, exactly. And they do have some, some chronic, uh, they do have some chronic pain. So, and I, and that is, that's a very good point. And thank you for reminding me of that as we are talking about chronic pain. And so we, these are the kinds of changes and the mindset shifts that we need to make um, when we're in chronic pain because that's the goal, right? The goal is not to complete a marathon because then you're going to be doing other things that might put you in chronic pain, but then they can come back to you and <laughs> yeah. and get some help with that. Here's another length, if you don't mind my saying, when I first became a personal trainer, I was working with people with squatting and lunging. One of the personal tra- the lead personal trainer came up to me and she's just like, what are you doing? And I said, I, well, I'm taking someone through a lunge. And she says, you can't do it like that. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, their knee is traveling over their toe. You can't allow that to happen. I said, what? Why is our ankle designed to allow the knee to travel over the toe then? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, that's just not done. It's not safe. And I says, what's not safe about this? Are you telling me that all NFL linemen are being unsafe because they're in their stance ready to, to explode and their knees are over their toes? Why can't we train like this? So I said, show me the research. And mm-hmm. of course, it doesn't exist. There are just these common myths. And it doesn't have when they happen in personal training. I mean, you read about a, f- a few of these every year in medicine where these common myths are dispelled about how we've always done things. And it just kind of turns everyone on their head. It's like, wow, I can't believe that. That's not true anymore. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The knees over. It's funny you bring up the knees over the toes thing, because that is something that my son, actually, who is a basketball player, he got caught onto this guy who, um, I think he's a physical therapist on Instagram. And anyway, I started trying to learn and all of that. And I've been incorporating that. And I've been doing a lot of mobility stuff with myself and with my clients with just, you know, kind of in that 90 degree angle and pushing that knee over the toe, which is like goes against everything I ever learned. But it also makes a lot of sense. And I've, I've helped people I shouldn't say helped, but I'm like, you know, try this for your plantar fasciitis. And they're like, yeah, that it's crazy that it makes a difference. Cause you're, you're stretching out that tendon, right? That Achilles tendon. And I don't know, yes. you probably know, the and, di- and, you probably know that more than I do. And Amy, I mean, it's not just you. I mean, I just interviewed an NFL lineman and that's what he was taught in his division one college for training, Yeah, you know? And, and so, and in, in the pros, and I'm just like, are you kidding me? Because I said, hey, you know, show me what your lunch looks like. And it looked really awkward. I'm just like, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm doing this. I said, why? I said, well, it was because that's how I was taught. I'm just like, well, I'm sorry. Get in your stance again to, to be on the line. Well, your knees are over your toes. Why aren't you training like this? And he's just like, I don't know. Because that's, that's what, what I've just been taught. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's what I've been taught. That's what I was and taught to teach. He didn't start having pain. Until he got into college and all of those elite trainers got hold of him and the NFL pros, because they're all following the same kinds of training patterns. When he was in high school, he just trained on his own. He didn't have a trainer. And so college is when his pain began. 
And I'm just like, this is why, you know? <laughs> and this is why you're so passionate about educating people because exactly. it's a different way. It's a different way than, than what has been ingrained in our head. Not only, you know, in fitness, but health too. I mean, when I train my therapists at my clinic, they're just like, what? <laughs> this, this, that's not how we were taught. I said, that's exactly why you're going to be successful because this is why we're having chronic pain is because of this lack of understanding of actually how the body should be used. Okay. Yeah. Now, one thing that I know you're really focused on, and I would love to talk a little bit more about is the aspect of our, and I'm just going to kind of lump this all together and then let you take it from here, but this somatic. So this is how our emotions and our trauma, um, how stress impacts our body. I had, um, a, an applied, um, no, I can't now I can't remember what it is. But anyway, she came on and she talked about it. And it's been just a hugely successful um, or popular podcast, because it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, my stress impacts my hip flexors, my stress is impacting other parts of my body. Like, why can't I just leave my head at the door and then, you know, and work my body out. So so talk to us some about um, this relationship and how that impacts our chronic pain. Sure. So I, I can really geek out on, on a lot of this stuff. So I'm going to try and keep it simpler. And I, I just want to give you an overview. So not all somatics are the same. It's a common term. However, I've trained under HANA somatics, which is a very different form of somatics than most other somatics that are out there. So let me first tell you how somatics fits into my equation of why we have pain. So the first person who I studied under, Dr. Shirley Saruman, was about movement mechanics and what is causing uh, just pain uh, from how we move. And that got a lot of people better. Then I studied uh, Thomas Meyer's information in Anatomy Trains, which talks about fascia and these super highways of fascia that run from our heads down to our toes and different parts of the body. And that taught me, unlike Dr. Shirley Sarman, it taught me how I can look further away from the source from where that pain is at other things that might be leveraging those problems. And so I started seeing a bigger increase. But then I ran into people who seemed to have a, like this battery that was charging their body to be in these dysfunctional patterns. And no matter how much I corrected their issues, their brain would cause their pattern to return again and again in the same patterns. And so that's when I discovered the Thomas Hanna's work in Hanna Somatics. And so not So this is the interesting thing. Dr. Saruman identifies three patterns of dysfunction causing almost all pain. They identify absolutely uh, right on with uh, Thomas Myers anatomy trains fascial concepts of these super highways. Then when I found Dr. Thomas Hanna's work in neurological uh, pain patterns, exactly the same three as Dr. Saruman and anatomy trains. Three different researchers studying three different things coming up with the same three primary patterns behind our dysfunction. So what the somatics does is uh, what happens is with emotional or psychological pain, I'm not going to get into all of the details because it's not really known, but I have a theory about what I think is going on. Anyway, that em what happens is uh, we are charging up what I think are these fascial superhighways of, of contraction through our body that connect from our head to our toe. And so what Thomas Hanna figured out was a way to disrupt the neural input charging this whole system. But he didn't disrupt it in just one or two muscles. He disrupted the whole system of stuff. So whatever, so he had these protocols, he developed these protocols where we haven't really discussed these, but uh, he would uh, uh, reduce the tension in all the muscles along a whole fascial superhighway to release tension. And what I have found clinically is when I do that and combine it with the biomechanics and uh, you know changing the movement habits that have, are feeding this, boom, chronic pain goes away. So what this does, what I found is that when you, if you have psychological trauma, uh, and by the way, you don't have to have psychological trauma to have these patterns. They're just more manifested more strongly in people with psychological trauma because uh, it's a recurring trauma, right? And so what I have found is that if I can release this pattern that their psychological trauma has caused, 
it helps them deal with the psychological trauma as well. Wow. So the mind not only affects the body, but affecting the body also affects the mind. It works both ways because really there, there's, no, there's no difference between the two. We're all one. And that's where the term soma comes from. It's the term that refers to both the mind and body as one organism instead of dividing them up into these categories. That has been probably the biggest learning curve I have had just in being uh, hosting this podcast and learning and really starting to pick it up. I mean, when I first started it, I thought, well, we'll talk about fitness and we'll talk about eating and then we'll talk about faith. And boy, I, I tell you what, it has turned into so much more of a holistic approach because that's what I'm learning is, is so important is that it is, it truly is mind body, even if you're not doing yoga, right? It's all, it's all connected. Yeah, That's where you're ahead of the game, Amy. You're, well, you're way ahead of the game, no. even thinking that, you know, and, Thanks. and while it's common to think, oh yeah, everyone hears the mind body. It's a completely different thing to use that to solve pain though. Right. And, and that's what this has been about. Yeah. The, the, I love hearing you talk about the fascia. We actually just had Sue Hitzman on. I don't know if you're familiar with her with Melt Method, but um, where she really taught us a lot about connective tissue. And so I really, I dig it when I have all of these different experts in different areas. And actually it's while they are speaking on one specific thing and you're talking about chronic pain, the, the knowledge is really integrated because again, going back to, it is all connected really quickly. You talked about the three patterns of dysfunction. Do you mind sharing mm -hmm. those with us really quickly? Oh yeah. I was hoping you'd ask that. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I feel like I should have just like handed over the mic and let you just go on. Cause I'm, I'm totally oh, no. digging all of this. So we've already talked about one pattern of dysfunction causing almost all back pain is this arching pattern uh -huh. that we talked about at the very beginning with the test and everything. So this is one pattern. Dr. Saruman identifies it as an extension problem, which means extension means arching. All right. Okay. So you've got a problem with arching that's causing your pain. However, and that's, that's, at the root of almost all back pain. The second most common pattern that's causing unilateral back pain or sciatic pain or SI joint pain is something that I've renamed and I call it a side bending problem. And so what that means is that one pelvis is higher than the other and typically one rib cage is lower than the other. A lot of practitioners can identify that a pelvis is higher but few even look at the rib cage to see if it's lower. So you can imagine I'm holding up a skeleton now and I'm lifting up the right side of the pelvis and I'm lowering down the right side of the rib cage. So you can imagine that then there is compression happening on that right side in the spinal column. Well, this is where all of our nerves exit from in our spine to comprise the sciatic nerve that runs down our legs. So this pattern is very common when you have someone with sciatic pain unilateral back pain, which will usually be on this side, SI joint pain, and so forth. So this is what I learned in somatics is that we have these deep with uh, reflex patterns that even though we don't operate on a daily basis, you know, reflexively responding to every stimulus in our life, this hardwired reflex patterns are still working in us under, un, in a subconscious way. And these, this pattern the side bending pattern typically occurs on this right side because of some old injury on the right side that hasn't been resolved correctly. So what the brain says, oh, you still got this problem on this right side. Well, I don't know exactly what that is, but here's what I'm going to do to get you off of that. I'm going to lift up this pelvis so that you can have less force acting through that right leg. And so over time, gradually this thing creeps up and then this thing creeps down because the muscles that are lifting the pelvis attach to the rib cage. And so they're pulling the rib cage down as well as lifting up the pelvis, right? And so this is why we develop these patterns. And so anyone usually who has this pattern typically will have an older pattern of problems down here that hasn't been resolved correctly yet. Before you go into the third one, is that something that can be resolved I assume through your program, but on our own, like, or without going, cause to oh, me, yeah. my mind goes to, Oh, you gotta go. I gotta get myself to a chiropractor if I'm having unilateral, which yeah. by the way, listeners, if you're not familiar with unilateral, that means on one side. So not low back pain on both sides, but it's just one side. The reason you're having this pattern isn't because you haven't been manipulated. All right. By a chiropractor. The reason you're having this pattern is because of how you're using your body. Okay. So if you want to solve this problem, 
ultimately, you need to fix the problem down here, which is typically a functional problem. But frankly, and like I mentioned at the beginning, standing and walking is the biggest habit that is causing almost all of these problems. It's the same here. I can fix this pattern in 10 steps by getting you to walk correctly. I don't care if it's been around for 20 years. It will be solved in 10 steps because I would show you how to walk correctly instead of how you're walking, which is reproducing this pattern all the time. In fact, I was just uh, went to Minnesota, uh, San Diego recently for a conference. And while I was at the airport, I, I saw all these people with this dysfunctional walking patterns. So I made these little videos of, of these people. And so when I got to my hotel room, I just commented on what I saw was going on and put them in slow motion and all this kind of stuff. So I'll be putting those on online uh, sometime soon. But anyway, it was a lot of fun for me. It's it's all over the place. Well, so how hard is that? I mean, walking is something, one of those things that we don't think a lot about. And a lot of us, yeah. especially in my community, we walk for exercise. So is this something exactly. that we have to be really intentional about? Or is it, I mean, how does that work? Because that's a, that's a lot, like if I want to go talk with my friends and talk and walk, I'm going to have a hard time <laughs> doing both of like, wait a minute, I need to change my, whatever it is, yeah. the gate, the step. I don't know. I mean, well, this is a great question. So I'll, I'll go into what really what your question is talking about. So here's, here's yet another test, folks, so you can try. This one's easy. So just clasp your fingers together as if you're praying. Okay. All right. Look at which thumb and finger is on top. Okay. Which one is it for you, Amy? My, it's my left is on top. My left thumb. Your left is on top. Now, without looking at your hands, I want you to unclasp your, your hands and now put them back together again with the opposite thumb and fingers on top. Okay. Yeah. You had to look, didn't you? Yes. Right? Well, I didn't have to look, but I had to be thoughtful about it. You wanted to be thoughtful and you wanted to check and make sure you did it right. Right. Okay. Now keep your hands in this position. So this feels unnatural. Yes. Your natural way of clasping your hands is to have the left thumb on top. The unnatural way is to have your right thumb on top. And so keeping your hands like this, you're getting a message from your brain. That's an alert that's saying, Hey, something's different about what you're doing here. And there's another part of your brain that's saying, this isn't right. We need to do it the way that we've been trained. Yes, but I really if, want to change right now. Yeah. But what if clasping your fingers with your right thumb on top instead of your left solved your pain? Totally do it. Your brain doesn't know that though. It only knows that you're doing something different. It doesn't yet know that that different thing is good for you. Okay. Just like it doesn't understand that the natural way that you're clasping your fingers is the thing that's causing your pain because the brain is saying, Hey, that's the way I've been taught. This is what we're doing. It hasn't yet learned that that is the source of the pain. So to answer your question about walking temporarily, when you learn to walk differently, yes, you have to put thought into it. It's like that old saying, you know, you have unconscious, what is it? Unconscious, um, uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but anyway, right now, all of these things are unconscious in you. And you have to bring that to consciousness, change it. And once you do that, it will become an unconscious train, change again. Okay. So yeah, so maybe for a couple of weeks, when you're walking with your friends, you're going to have to say, hey, hold on, I just need to check in on my gate. Right? <laughs> but, but after that, you'll have it because you've, you're now feeling better. Okay. That's reinforced the idea that, oh yeah, this is what I need to do. So your brain accepts that change better. Okay. Got it. All right. Okay. I feel like I could ask, I could keep you on all day, but th that's not fair to you or to um, the people listening. So I want to kind of pull this in. We've talked a lot about your program, which is the fixing you method. And um, this sounds super interesting. So tell us some about the whole uh, method, the program, what to expect with it and how, and most importantly, how it can help people. Yeah. So uh, expect to learn a lot because it's really like if it, the theme that you and I have been talking about, Amy, is basically how this makes sense, but it's not really how things are taught, right? right? It's not how we're trained as medical professionals and health and wellness professionals, right? So you're going to hear and see different things, but this is exactly what I believe is why you're having chronic pain is because everyone's doing the same thing with you, maybe in a different way, but they're not really getting to the reasons you're having the pain in the first place. So uh, I wrote my Fixing You series of books about 10 or 12 years ago, and uh, that was great. And then I owned my clinic for about 10 years. But through that volume of people, I've learned that, hey, I don't have to solve. 
a thousand different things, I learned that everyone's having the same pattern of issues. It's just manifested in different people differently. It's like the same pattern of issues for you, Amy, might manifest as back pain. In another person, that pattern may manifest as sciatic pain. In a third, it may manifest as SI joint pain. But the same pattern is causing all of those things. It, the difference is how you've lived your life, how you've exercised, what you do for a living, all that kind of stuff, past injuries and so forth. So my home programs have simplified this so significantly. In fact, like the back pain program, I think it's like maybe seven exercises to solve your chronic back pain and sciatica. They're so much simpler and they're all video based. So I'm guiding you through the exercises to solve this. Okay. So a big part of my programs also is I have taping recommendations because just like clasping like your KT fingers, tape, that type of thing. No, it's, no. it's a, I, I use Luco tape P and cover roll stretch Okay. because the taping that you're going to be doing has to really hold something because your brain doesn't know how to change what you're doing yet. Ah. So we use taping as the bridge. And when you tape something in a correct way and it takes away your pain, you're just like, oh, this is why I have to do this, right? These okay. exercises to make this happen. Then once you do that, you can wean yourself off the tape. But it's just like clasping those fingers differently, right? Your brain doesn't know how to do that yet. And so you need a little help. And that's where the taping comes in. And then the third thing are the um, habits. You have to change the habits that are causing the tighter, weak muscles in the first place. And if you fix the tighter, weak muscles, but you don't change the habits, well, guess what? You're just going to keep feeding the same pattern of problems. And then finally, you, you mentioned this Hannah Somatics. I have, I have eight audio lessons in there. For those people who are really in really bad chronic pain, who are really afraid to start something new, and they're worried about hurting themselves, by all means, start with the Somatics bonus lessons because those are so gentle and so powerful at unlocking those fascial superhighways of contraction working on your body right now. So I want to do a recap and then I actually need to go back and close the loop on something we were just talking about. So with the fixing you with the videos, there's, there's exercises, there's mm -hmm. taping and then habits. And then there's also the somatic bonus stuff. Now we yeah. talked about the patterns of dis dysfunction and I stopped on the side bending and then I forgot to go back and get the third one. So one of them was the back extension and arching. One of them was the side bending. And then what was the third? The third is a flexion problem. And frankly, less than 1% of people that I even see in my clinic ever even have this. Okay. That's why I don't even include it in my program because it would just be wasted time. I, okay. I want to hit what 99% of the people are experiencing rather than that other 1%. And so I wouldn't even worry about that one. All right. Yeah. I just wanted to know, because I know sometimes when I'm listening, I'm like, he said there were three and you only said two. <laughs> yeah. No. I wanted to make sure we yeah. didn't miss anything. So yeah. tell me how fixing you would fit into someone's current exercise or movement routine. I mean, I have a lot of conversation of like, yeah, you know, I would love to do that. I would love, but I don't have time or I don't want to sacrifice yeah. what I'm already doing, which I have a feeling you might be like, well, let's maybe put that on pause. But like, how long are the videos? How often do you recommend that we do them? That kind of stuff. Yeah. The, so the first phase of the program is the pain reduction phase where you reduce your pain. Mm -hmm. And so that phase takes maybe, I think, 20 minutes to do. Oh, okay. okay. Like I said, it's seven exercises. So it's really easy. I, I don't count changing habits as an exercise because it's just... Once you learn what you need to do differently, you just do it when you sit down, right. you know, and, and the taping is an exercise because it's not an exercise. It's just a taping technique to support a part of your body that needs support. And you won't be taping forever or anything like that. So really the exercise portion of things, 20, 25 minutes, I think. Okay. And then, uh, and then like that first, I've even made it a, a first set and a second set because the first set has all of my instructions. Well, no one wants to listen to all of that. Uh, over and over again. So I've made a second set without all those instructions. That's even faster. So Got it. It, okay. it's really quick. It's really uh, quick. Okay. All right. This is super, um, that, and that's super doable too, right? Like 20 minutes, oh, yeah. we can do this and 20 minutes is worth it to yeah. help your chronic pain. I mean, you don't need any special equipment. I mean, most people might have an exercise tube. You might need something like an exercise band. Mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, really, you don't need any special equipment. It's Got it. 
which is consistent with what you're talking about too, right? Like all of the ways that we were designed to move and the way that we would normally move before we had an injury or before we had some trauma or before we learned the wrong way or our personal trainer had our pull pull us our shoulders back and down during the core. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, you know, I used to teach the same thing until I figured this out. So, you know, you know, we're yeah. always learning, right? I mean, that's the exactly. great thing about science and research and we're always learning. So that's fine. Okay. I have, so before I get to that final question um, or my, the final questions I ask all my guests, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you're like, man, I really want to say this? Well, two things. One, I wanted to save all of your listeners 20%. So if they end up buying one of my programs, just type in fixing you all one word in the coupon and you'll get 20% off whatever you purchase. And that goes for the online training program for health and wellness practitioners too. Okay. Uh, The last thing I want to say is a lot of people with chronic pain feel that they're broken because they've been to person after person who can't help them, but you are not broken. It's just that you haven't gotten the right information yet. And I believe that I have that information for you. Okay. That's really good. Okay. Questions I ask all my guests. Number one is I love learning about people's tattoos because I found that when someone decides to put something on their body for the rest of their life, often, but not always, they have a good story or a meaning behind it. So I was wondering if you had any tattoos, if you would mind sharing uh, what it is and the meaning behind it. And if you don't, but you had to get one, what would it be and where would it go? Oh gosh. Uh, I thought for years about getting a tattoo. But I, it was such a big choice in my life. I just couldn't come up with a, a place or a tattoo that I felt was meaningful enough for me to go through all of that to get some something on my body. Gosh, I mean, if I were to do it today, maybe I'd do, you know, fixing you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> all right, that's fair. <laughs> a walking billboard. That's great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what Very- I'm all about. Right. <laughs> um, tell people how they can connect with you. If you go to rickolderman.com, you know, you can hit my contact there, but really rick at rickolderman.com is, is I'm just an email person. I, I'm not savvy with all of the other things that people do in social media. So just old fashioned, pick up the phone or just email me and, and I'll get back to you as, as best I can. But Fantastic. Awesome. Before we go, I want to let you know that I checked out and tried out the Fixing You program for chronic pain. I really was pleasantly surprised at how gentle and easily accessible these movements are. Rick truly does help your pain by giving you the knowledge and tools and guiding you through stretches and light strengthening movements. So be sure to check out that program, the Fixing You method for whatever chronic pain you may be having. The link is in the show notes. I am inviting my all of my guests to offer the one simple thing for my listeners to remember. So this can be a small little nugget that we've talked about in our conversation today. It can be an overarching theme. But as we close it out, what is the one simple thing that you want people to remember? I want people to remember that they are responsible for their pain. Something you are doing is causing your pain. Only you can really unlock this. I'm here to guide you in that process. But, you know, if you keep looking for other people to solve your pain for you, and, you know, if there's a tear or something, yes, get surgery, right? But I'm talking about this chronic thing that you just can't really figure out. Really, it's how you're using your body. And that's what I mean by you are the source of your pain. You've got to think about using your body differently. And I, and hopefully you've gotten some clues here in this podcast today that say, oh yeah, this makes sense then try that. Just try the little nuggets you heard here. See if it changes something. I can almost bet that it will. Awesome. Okay. That is all for today. Go out there and have a great day. 